My name is Jacob Yarber. I'm a peer leader of AAMI. I'm a mathematics major and I'm a junior here at East Georgia State College. I'd like to welcome you to our first African American male initiative event. I'm going to begin by providing a brief history of AAMI, allow some of the members to discuss a conference they attended in Atlanta, and then you will hear from our guest speaker. When the University System of Georgia launched AAMI as a quantitative and qualitative research study in fall 2002, there were only three programs at the University System of Georgia institutions that focused specifically on the educational achievement and attainment of African American males. Ten years later, there are 36 programs on 26 of USG's 35 campuses engaging young black men in college life and focusing their sights on earning a college degree. The East Georgia State College African American Initiative Program was implemented this fall with the hopes and goals of cultivating an environment that empowers, inspires, and motivates African American males on our campus to excel academically. Now we will hear from three East Georgia students who had an opportunity to participate in an AAMI conference which was held in Atlanta, Georgia. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Justin Lubo. I'm a third year student in East Georgia. My major is physical therapy. And right now, I just want to share with you a little bit of my experiences dealing with AMI. Amazing is not the word that can be used when it comes to describing my experience at this AAMI conference. This conference has done more for me than words can describe. The call for African American males is much needed in the world today. This is why more AMI programs should be put in, in black communities. AMI speaks out on coming into manhood, becoming successful, reaching back into the community, and overcoming the graduation statistics of black males in college. This saddens me that more African American males cannot attend this conference. This is why with the help of the school and the principal, more African American males can attend this inspirational AAMI conference. The first day of this conference struck me with a mighty blow. Our keynote speakers were truly motivational. The title of this powerful sermon was A Call to Manhood. In this brief session, we discuss key problems in the black community, and most importantly, what is manhood? Each speaker gave an insight on their lives and what they did in their lives to reach the road to success. One thing that all the speakers had in common was they believed that success is only reached through hard work and nothing is given to you but only can be earned. Now I would like to read to you a poem that was truly inspirational to me, entitled If by Rudyard Kipling. If, if you can keep your head when all around you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust in yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, if you can, if, if, or being lied about, do not deal in lies, or being hated, do not give way to hating, and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your masters, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and defeat and treat those two impostors just the same, if you can bear the, the truths you've spoken, twisted by knives and make traps for fools, or watch the things you've given your life to broken and stop and build them up with worn out tools, if you can make a heap of all your winning and risk it at one turn of a toss or pitch and lose and start again at your beginning and never breathe a word about your loss, if you can force your heart and nerve to sinew and serve your turn long after your turn is gone, and so hold on when there's nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with the crowd and keep, and keep your virtue, if you can walk with kings, no lose the common touch. If all men count on you, but none too much, if you can, feel the, if you can feel, fulfill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, Yours is, yours is the world and everything that is in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Demetrius Boston. I'm a business administration. And I'm gonna give, share with you a little experience I had. This conference had opened my eyes to a lot of things I needed to know in order to be successful. It was an experience that has impacted my life and gave me the opportunity to change for the best. 
The three things I took from this conference were to stay motivated, keep pushing, and don't be afraid to be yourself. I see so much potential in these two guys up here and the ones around campus. And if we all work together, we can make a change. To me, failure is not an option. And it's not about how many times you fail in life. It's about how many times you try until you succeed. Plenty of ideas ran through my mind on how to start this program at East Georgia State College. At the conference, we were surrounded by millionaires, producers, and movie directors who all were successful. And I thought to myself, why this can't be me in the future? And how it will make a difference to this college, community, and most importantly, the world. It also was a pleasure to be the first group from this college to be selected for the trip. And when we do leave East Georgia State College, we will leave great information to the upcoming young man who wants to be a part of this organization. Every single person in here has a purpose and the potential to be the best person you can be in life. I would like to thank Dr. Bomer, Ms. Bomer, Mr. Drummer, Ms. Deborah, Ms. Johnson, and all the rest of the people who put this trip together. And if I have inspired someone out of this audience this morning, then my mission is complete. I am honored to, and very happy to have witnessed something so special. And lastly, if you cannot see the bright side of life, then polish the dull side. And the greatest pleasure in life is doing what others say you cannot do. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, first off, I want to thank the students that came to participate in this event today. I'm happy that y'all took the time out to come here and listen to us speak about what we feel a success is and how we experience success through our life. Uh, my name is Thomas Simons. I'm a peer leader here at East Georgia State College. My major is business and I'm minor in communications. Um, I want to say, first off, say these guys did an excellent job explaining AMMI and what do they think for how do they feel for them? Well, for me personally, to me, it's about giving back. They stress the importance about giving back to your community, to your life, and to everybody around you. AMI, AAMI is a group of people, a group of successful individuals that came back and helped young men like myself to give back and help them experience the resources they need to graduate. I want to say that they, they empowered us by giving us the resources they gave an ear to listen to. They listened to all our, any advice they gave. They gave us resources, and I love that. They encouraged me from somebody that has came from a, the ghetto. They you know, experienced gang violence, that experienced drugs, domestic violence. They inspired me, showing me that somebody that's been in my position has succeeded in life, and is doing well, and is giving back. So I ask you on today just to give back to somebody on today. Either it's by telling them thank you, opening the door, or helping them with their homework. That can change their life, just like they changed my life. Thank you. Thank you, Justin and Demetrius and Thomas. In 2010, Mr. Frederick Bailey served as an AAMI peer mentor at the University of West Georgia. And to this day, he is still in contact with three of the four student mentees. The AAMI program at West Georgia is a living learning community where participants in their first and second semesters take specific courses, attend study hall, and receive a peer mentor. Mr. Bailey currently serves as the AAMI living learning community coordinator at Gordon State College. The AAMI program at Gordon State offers seminars, personal and professional development workshops, social events, and club activities for the students that are involved. The students that are in the program take Mr. Bailey's first year experience course, which is designed specifically for African American males, and it helps to gain an understanding of each individual student because they live in the resident halls where Mr. Bailey serves as their resident coordinator. We are excited about Mr. Bailey's rich involvement with AMI, and we are thrilled to have Mr. Bailey visit our campus today. He will be here for the morning, and later this afternoon, he will visit our Statesboro campus. Mr. Bailey's father will now give you an introduction in depth, and then you will hear from him. Thank you. Good morning. I want to come before my son present this morning. That was a great introduction, talking about my son. But before we get him to the podium, I want to talk about how he got where he is before he became 
what he just talked about. My son was born and he was dealt what he thought was a bad hand. He thought he was dealt with a hand that had stolen his dreams, his visions, his determination, and his will to live. And I often rem remember or remind myself of a story that I heard concerning an old man and a young man. These two individuals sat down one day to eat. And as they, as they bowed their heads to bless their food, they had this big steak on the plate. They closed their eyes, and the old man began to pray and to bless the food. As they blessed their food, a dog ran by and snatched the steak off the plate and kept running. The old man opened his eyes, and when he saw that the steak was gone, he lifted up his hands with a big smile and said, thank you. The little boy that was sitting beside him said, sir, why are you lifting your hands with a big smile and saying thank you? He says, don't you know that that dog just stole your steak? The old man looked at the little boy and said, son, he stole my steak, but not my appetite. Frederick, he was dealt a bad hand but it didn't steal his appetite. I'm standing before people today that you possibly think that your appetite has been stolen, but you're sitting in a room today. In this room, you can dream, and you can dream big. The sky is not the limit. We have evidence that man have been to the moon. I want you to stand on your feet in this place this morning I want you to put the most powerfulest things that you have on your body, which is your hands. I want you to stand and let's raise the roof in this place and help me welcome my son to the stage at this time, Frederick R. Bailey. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me well? Can you hear me in the back? All right, good. Well, that introduction was wonderful, right? Uh, but I don't really need all that, okay? But, uh, but thank you. Uh, let's, let's give these guys a round of applause. Can we do that? Uh, what, you, what you guys see in front of you are leaders. Okay, student leaders. So thank you guys for so much for, for sharing AMI and being here. I know it's take courage to speak, especially in front of high school students, because y'all be looking like this. You know, y'all be looking me, look at right here, I see you. <laughs> you know, so it's very hard standing before people, okay, especially 11 o'clock in the morning, all right? It's lunchtime, right? Everybody get hungry. He said, appetite, I was hungry already. You know, so when he said, appetite, I'm thinking about that steak for real, you know. So, uh, but thank, uh, I would like to thank my father and my mother uh, Regina, she's sitting here for, uh, for uh, coming with me, so thank you guys so much. But most importantly, guys, if you could please uh, give a round of applause for the person who put this together, uh, Ms. Deborah uh, Cottrell Michael. Give it a round of applause for her. I knew the Michael part, I tried to get Cottrell. Thank you so much for having me. We would like to thank the president. Uh, so give the president a round of applause of, of the school. Thank you so much and his lovely wife. Uh, thank you guys for having me. Uh, it, it is an honor and a privilege to be here today. Now they told me I only had 30, 35 minutes. All right, my time starts now. I'll just <laughs> so how long do I have? Okay, so let me know five minutes uh, before I close. All right, so today I want to talk to you guys, okay, um, about, about a situation. Anybody have been on a roller coaster before? Raise your hand, come on. Well, first of all, well, who do we have in the room? High school students? What grade are you guys in, ninth grade? What, make some noise if you're in ninth grade. <laughs> Y'all scared? What, make some noise if you're in 10th grade? He said one person in 10th grade. Man, you gotta represent 11th grade. <laughs> okay, man. <laughs> they throwing up, what are all this? Uh, 12th grade, 12th grade. He said whoop. <laughs> Two 12th grade, 11th grade, one more time. Uh, I don't know what y'all talking about. Huh? All right, uh, college student, freshmen, make some noise. 
All right? Sophomore, make some noise. Any juniors in the house? <laughs> Is junior? Oh, one junior. He said, I took so many classes, I don't know what I am. I'm just, I, I'm just here. All right, what about faculty and staff? Faculty, make some noise. <laughs> she like this. She by herself. Uh, uh, staff, make some noise. If you faculty and staff make some noise. Yeah. All right, now everybody make some noise. Yeah. <laughs> All right, good. All right, uh, now my time starts. I'm just, I'm just joking. Um, I'm not going to be before you guys long. I promise you I got 30 minutes to deliver what I came to, to deliver. Raise your hand if you ever been on a roller coaster. Raise them high. I want to see those hands. Mm. All right, so pretty much we all have been on a roller coaster. Guess what? We have seen a roller coaster, correct? Right. So what happens when you get on a roller coaster? You're excited, right? Well, some people are nervous. Now, I'm going to tell you about myself. I am very nervous to get on a roller coaster, but I promise I love it. And when I'm, in, when I'm high and going down, I'm hollering like a girl. I'm like, ah, I'm, I'm having fun, right? But I'm nervous now. But when you get on a roller coaster, what happens? You're excited. When the roller coaster takes off, what direction are you going in? Talk to me, huh? You're going, when you first start in the roller coaster, you're going on a straight, straight path, right? Then what happens after a while, you start taking a little turn, right? Everybody, everybody with me? You start taking a little turn on the roller coaster. Then all of a sudden, you're going up, right? You're going up, you, somebody say it drop, all right? And all of a sudden, it takes a little time. And sometimes they keep you at the top. They just, they hold you right there for like five, ten seconds. Well, it feels like a minute or two, right? And all of a sudden, what happens? You just drop and you just hollering. Your hair going back, uh, spit going back. I mean, you don't, I mean, you just tear, you crying. You don't know what's going on, right? So I said that, guys, because our life is just like that roller coaster. My life was just like that roller coaster. Uh, when my life was just like that roller coaster, I grew up in LaGrange, Georgia. You might have heard LaGrange, Georgia before, Troop County. All right, grew up in LaGrange, Georgia. Both parents, father, mother, both parents was on drugs. Dad was an alcoholic. Dad, before, I, before I go into that, I would, would like to start off. Um, how old do you think I am, sir? Yep. He said, don't do that. He said, third, uh, what, your teacher here? Your teacher here? Your teacher here? Okay, we're going to email make sure you get an F. I don't know what <laughs> but, uh, how old do you think I am, sir? You said what? You said 24? I, I like you, man, already. I knew something about you. No. But I'm 26 years old. And I want to state my age because most people do, they think I'm 30. They think I'm almost 40. Someone told me I would look like I was 40. And I said, wait a minute now. Not 40. Okay? So I want you to guys know that I'm not too old. Okay? I'm still young. So I'm 26. All right? But both parents was on drugs, crack, cocaine, marijuana, alcoholic, okay? My dad, my dad got paid every Friday. Whoever I love, though, every week checks, right? I look forward to my dad getting paycheck. But let me tell you something. My dad didn't come home with the receipt in his hand saying, son, all right, y'all talking while I'm doing my presentation. So my dad didn't say, son, we, I got the receipt. The light bill has been paid. The rent has been paid. Here's the grocery receipt. Dad came home with, with alcohol, with marijuana, crack cocaine in his hand. And so dad and mom, they went in the room, closed the door. And they did whatever they did in the room behind closed doors. Now, remind you guys, at this point in my life, I am, uh, I am in the fifth, fourth grade. All right, seven, eight, nine, ten years old. I'm experienced this in my house. And because of my parents' addiction, we didn't, have, we didn't have food at home. There was times, guys, I promise you, I went home, I didn't, I didn't see a meal at home. I cried myself to sleep every single night because, you know, mom and dad was in the room. They was happy. They didn't really need the food, but I was hungry. And the only meal that I would get was, was in school. In school, I ate breakfast, and I ate lunch, and I ate your lunch, and I ate your lunch, right? I had perfect attendance. I was there every day, early. And I was the last one to leave school because I didn't know if I would get a meal at home. Because of my parents' addiction, we moved every single year. Every single year I was at a different elementary school. Every year. I couldn't read. I couldn't write. They told me I couldn't read. They told me that I couldn't write. Because of my parents' addiction, if we didn't move, they put us out. So I'm in the fifth grade, getting off, get, uh, off the bus, 
friends, we laughing, we talking, we joking. But as I approached my house, I noticed that, that my TV, my bed, my clothes is sitting on the side of the road. And I'm in the fifth grade, and mom and dad wasn't at home to say, son, you know, we're going to take you somewhere safe. Son, we, we're going we're gonna to make this better for you. Because of my parents' addiction, I had to go to other family members and ask for food. And one aunt, she fed me, fed me good. But while I was eating, she said, I'm tired of Frederick, and I'm tired of his parents. I'm in the fifth grade. I don't know any better, right? And, I, and I, as I heard those words, I began to, I dropped my head, and I said, why is this happening to me? And I began to cry, and I told my aunt, I said, thank you for the food. And I promise you, I walked home that night, and I said, I would rather die than ask anybody else for something to eat. So pride began to build up. I didn't ask nobody for anything. I'm a man. I do it on my own. I take care of it by myself. Don't need anybody to feed me. Because of my parents' addiction, there were times where we didn't even have running water at home. I'm sleeping in the dark, waking up in the dark. Mom waking me up going to school. Going to school, clothes wrinkled, clothes dirty. Wearing my, my other uh, sister, my brother clothes. Now, not like a pink shirt, you know, with flowers on it. Not that type, okay? Just her clothes, it belongs to her. Because of their addiction, I didn't have running water. I didn't bathe every night. I didn't brush my teeth every day. I couldn't have food every day. So what must I do? I had too much pride to ask my brother who stayed two houses down to, for anything. So there was a bucket on the, back, on the back of my house. And I said, I must do something to survive. And I'm in the sixth grade at this point. So I must do something to survive in the sixth grade. So I took that bucket, I promise you guys, I took that bucket, and I put that bucket on the front porch of my step. And I told myself I would literally wait on the rain to survive. And I literally would sit there and wait till it rain. And when it rained, oh, it was a happy day for me. I don't know about y'all, but I was happy because I took that water, and I would run back in the house, and I would, would, would heat that water up. And I would bathe myself with rain water, soap and rag crying every day because I knew life was better than this. I knew that living in the ghetto, living in the projects, life has to be better than this. And I remember on my knees, uh, sixth grade with a bar of soap in my hand, washing my jeans, <laughs> washing my jeans. Mom and dad didn't come in the room and say, son, we're going to take care of you. And tears rolled down my eyes because I'm in the sixth grade. I shouldn't have to live like this. Life has to be better than this. And let me tell you something. Clothes didn't dry every night. Clothes didn't dry every night. So in the wintertime, you know how freezing cold it is in January and in October, November? So I'm at the bus stop, cold, freezing, fighting back tears. I'm doing this at the bus stop because I didn't want my homeboys to see that I was hurting inside. I didn't want no one to see the pain that was, that, was, that was going on at home, and I would carry an extra jacket with me. And with that extra jacket, I would cover myself up so I wouldn't leave stains behind on the bus, because they would talk about you. I don't want to leave stains behind at the seat in the classroom because they would talk about me. So my jeans are wet, my underclothes are wet, my shirt is wet. Because of my parents' addiction, because of their addiction, because we moved, because all the situation that was going on, months later, same scenario, caught my father cheating on my mother. He was at another house. They had food. They had music. They had water. They had electricity. They had all this stuff. My mom and I sitting at home, hungry, starving. Where's dad? When is he coming home? And you know what I told myself? Why should I live this life we call life? No one loves me. Mother don't even love me. Dad cheating on us. He doesn't even care. So, so I, did what, I did what I knew how, so I had a knife in my hand. And I was about to take my own life. I had a knife, and I thought about, I thought about all the struggle, all the pain, the kick out, the not having food, the struggles. And I said, no one loves me in this world, so why should I even live if no one loves me? They wouldn't care if I'm gone. Matter of fact, they probably wouldn't even cry. And I thought about all the times of washing clothes, and I thought about the time that when I, was, when I was three or four years old, how I was touched by another man. I 
I was touched by another man. Not only that, but he messed my life because I didn't know who Frederick was. I didn't know myself. So I wanted to kill myself. I wanted to take the knife and take it in my life. But I thought about it. I said, well, you may live. It may hurt. So I didn't take the knife. And I thought about taking sleeping pills. I said, well, maybe I just sleep myself away. Won't no one miss me. But I'm, I can stand before you today and say, I'm so grateful. I'm so happy that I didn't take that knife. I'm so happy that I didn't take those pills because of my situation. And so months, so, so months went on. And I got, it, I got connected in school, and I got connected in the after-school program. And, and the program, one of the things about the program, they provided uh, after-school uh, pr- uh, snacks. So you know I was in that program. <laughs> I was there. I, I, was the, I was the first one there and the last one to leave. And, and on this, on this uh, program, Mr. Cofield, he was the van driver for the program. So while he was van driving, he said, you guys want to go to church? Just middle school students. I said, sure, I'm going to go to church because I knew I needed help. I needed something greater than what I see in front of me. So we went to church. The second visit, I'm not trying to impress and impose my, my religion or what I believe on you guys, but I knew I needed God. I knew he's the only one that's going to help me. So the second visit to the church, I gave my life to Christ, 14 years old in the eighth grade. Wasn't ashamed, wasn't, didn't feel anything about it. And I promise you, when I did that, I thought my life was going to be perfect. I know Jesus now, right? I said, my life is going to be good. I thought that for three weeks, okay? I said, lights won't get turned up. We have food on the table. Three weeks went by. It was good. But I went home. The lights were turned off. The lights got turned off so many times, guys. I promise you, you could feel the presence on the steps that the lights was off before you even walk in the house. And so I called, I called the cold fields, and I said, I need somewhere to stay. I had to let pride go at that time. I got tired of hurting by myself, right? So I let pride go. They said, well, it's late in the evening. Go down to your grandmother's house. Grandmother had her four children with their four children in a three-bedroom. So where am I going to fit, right? So I stayed at home, cried myself to sleep. But I promise you, the next day, that man and that woman was at my house. Anybody been to uh, Kroger, Piggly Wiggly, those little sacks they give you, grocery sacks? I had had a clothes, uh, a bag full of clothes. And I went to the Cofield's house, and I asked to spend the night one night. But guys, I promise you, I didn't leave their house till six years later. Six years later. And, and I remember, and I always tell people, when I first went to the Cofield's house, they lived on the other side of town. So, you know, the only time you go on the other side of town unless you're just passing through, right? You never visit. You don't know about on the other side of town. So they lived in a place called Brookstone Estates. And I said, wait a minute, where, where we at? So I said, these folks got some money, right? <laughs> I said, I'm kind of glad I came over here. So we pulled in. They had a two-car garage. Uh, they had a big yard, backyard. I mean, the house was huge, and I thought these people had money. I said, yes, I have hit the jackpot. I think I'm going to be staying here, okay? But they didn't know. I didn't know I was going to be there six years. When we walked in the house, they had uh, uh, Miss Cofield was cooking dinner, and she had uh, a steak, baked potato, a salad or something like that. And guys, I promise you, it wasn't no little fake steaks or anything like that. It was a real steak. And I said, thank you. I'm staying. Like, I really hit the jackpot. And I thought these people had some money. So guess what I wanted to do? I wanted to stay. But little did I know it wasn't all that it, that it seemed to be. And I went to the Kofi's house. They had two younger sons. I was 14. The other ones maybe 11, 12. They were younger than I, than I were. And I, guys, I promise you, not one time that I hear those young men say, I'm ready for Frederick to go home. Frederick is taking up my stuff. Matter of fact, the youngest son gave up his bedroom so that I may have my own bedroom and my own bed, and he went to sleep in the other room with his other brother. He didn't even complain about it. When Christmas came around, guess who had Christmas clothes just like the other guys? Frederick had some Christmas clothes. Guess who, guess who you know, we, we, had, we had the food on the table, we had the transportation, we had the phones. And everything was good. And birthday came around. They gave us money. They gave us prizes. So everything was good until one day. So I didn't realize that, you know, when one child do good, they all do good, right? If it's Christmas come, all your brothers and sisters get something, right? But I didn't realize that one do bad, you all get in trouble too. I wasn't expecting that one. So I remember one time, I'll never forget, you know, Schofield working, I think, third shift job. And the youngest son, he forgot to wash the dishes. Why did he do that on school night? 
So I'm asleep 3 o'clock in the morning. Miss Fo- Cofield come in there, knocking on the door. Beating, I mean, she's knocking, actually opening. I mean, it was knocking trying to get us up, not trying to say, can I come in? It was knocking, y'all need to get up, turn the light on. And she said, uh, who's supposed to clean up their kitchen? <laughs> Uh, Quez, the youngest brother, she said, I don't care who's supposed to clean, everybody get up. It was what, two dishes in that sink. I said, you woke me up for this? <laughs> in the back of my mind, you know, I said, this lady is crazy. You know, but I didn't want to tell her that because I looked at my surroundings, I said, I need a place to stay, right? <laughs> so I didn't want to tell her she was crazy. But I said, you woke up for this? But it was that moment I knew that these folks are for real. I'm their son for real. That made sense. They could have just, leave Frederick, let him go to sleep. He had a hard life. Let's just let him go to sleep i never forget, I was 18. This man right here is a character. I was 18 years old. I think he took, he took, he took our cell phones. Let me tell you something. When, when, before I moved in their house, I told myself, I'm grown. 14, I'm grown. Anybody else say that in this room? Mm-hmm. Look at you. He said, yeah. Look at you. I see. He said, yeah. I, I said, I'm grown. I didn't tell him that, but in my mind, I'm grown. So he took my cell phone. I said, Mr. Kofi, I said, you know, I said, I need to have a word with you if you don't mind. He said, sure, let's, let's talk. Now, remind you, he took the cell phone because the youngest son, here we go again. Anybody the youngest in the room? The youngest always got you in trouble? Or you got, uh-huh, you got your siblings in trouble. But the youngest always get us in trouble. So, so Mr. Cofield, he took, he took our phone. And I said, Mr. Cofield, I said, I just graduated, you know, 18 years old. You know, I, I would love to have my phone back. And he said, well, Frederick, to be honest with you, you know, I don't care if you're 18, 19, 88, 99. He said, as long as you're living in this house, I'll take whatever that is in this house. And I wanted to say, man, you don't get out my face. But again, I looked at my surroundings and I said, well, keep the phone. <laughs> I go buy me a little prepaid and keep it, you know. But I promise you guys, it wasn't one got in trouble, we all got in trouble. One got some stuff, guess what? We all shared the, the same benefits. Whether it was good benefits, whether it was bad benefits. And let me tell you something. And the Cofields didn't have all the finances I thought they had. They didn't have everything. And they adopted another son. So now there's four guys in the house. And Mr. Cofield, he, he was out of work. Ms. Cofield was in and out of work. And I promise you, I still don't know how we made it to this day, but I promise you, every night we had something to eat. It probably wasn't a steak every night. Probably a little cheap steak, TV them. But guess what? We had something to eat every night. And I promise you, the light stayed on. The mortgage got paid. I didn't have to worry about who's going to pay the bill. And I'll never forget the time. And, 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 and it's another. I was wrestling in the house. And, and, and one of the guys, he, uh, I don't know what I was trying to be, Superman or something. So I picked him up, dropped him on the couch. The couch broke in half. Miss Kofi is asleep. It, it was so loud, she woke up out of her sleep. Kind of, She said, I don't know who broke it. I don't know what y'all doing, but somebody got to pay for that couch. And I said, oh, my God. So I had to get a job at Kroger. Man, they, they took all my check because I, mean, I had to buy. She literally made me buy another couch. Did you not? She made me buy another couch. I said, I should go back home. I helped my mom pay light bill over there. But, you know, what I'm sitting here paying for a couch. But that's how it was. It didn't matter. I was family in their house, and they taught me things. And so six years later, I went to the Cofields. But see, guys, like I said, my life is just like that roller coaster. In a straight path, everything is going good. And we start hitting corners in our lives. And we start taking, we start going up this, this, this slope. And all of a sudden, we drop. And at this point in my life, I'm dropping. And then sometimes we hit, we hit a loop. Anybody ever hit a loop in their life? They had to revisit some situations. I had to revisit multiple situations in life, and that's how we are related to the roller coaster. I'm almost finished. Let me tell you something. Statistics will tell you that I'm not supposed to be standing before you today. Statistics will tell you that I'm supposed to be just like my father, that I'm supposed to be on drugs, alcohol, possibly even selling, because I used to steal. I, I took things that didn't belong to me. People think that I came from a wealthy background. Let me tell you, no, I did not. I grew up in the projects. We lived in the projects. And I was scared, too, but you better believe it. <laughs> My cousin said, they trying to fight me, Ann. <laughs> you better go do something. I was scared living in the projects. <laughs> I, you know, you guys know how it is in the projects, OK? They see talking about, well, they trying to fight me. Pick, what you want me to do? You should have kept your mouth closed. I mean, <laughs> it's your fault. Now, you got to deal with him, OK? But, but I promise you guys, statistics will tell you that I'm not supposed to be standing before you. Statistics would tell you that I'm supposed to be in and out of jail. Statistics would tell you that I, I, I'm, I, I should not have went to college. 
So Tessa would tell you that I have a baby mama here and a baby mama there and all these different places. But guys, let me tell you something. And ladies, let me tell you something about statistics. Let me tell you about something, too, because people will speak stuff over your life as well. People will say you cannot read. People will say you cannot write. And they told me I couldn't read. They told me I couldn't write. I was an at-risk student. I was labeled Frederick Bailey at-risk student. But guys, let me tell you something. I left the Coldfield House. I graduated from high school in 2006. I had a 3.0 GPA when I graduated, uh, high, when I graduated from high school. I went to uh, Gordon State College, well, which is now Gordon State College. Guys, I went to that school as a student in 2007. I became a resident assistant. I became a senator of the SGA. The, a year later, I became the president of the student body, go of student body government. Now, remind you, the year uh, after that, 2009, I became the president of an organization called Brother to Brother. Brother to Brother, main goal is to help increase graduation rate, help students read and write. Now, remind you, I couldn't read nor write, but yet I'm standing as a president to help somebody else read and write. Let me tell you, every standardized test came my way. I failed every standardized test that came my way. I promise you, I was, because I was SGA president, I was on the board to hire the next vice president of the college. Let me tell you something. I was the only student in the room. Everyone else had the highest degree they could get in their field, which is uh, most of the time a doctorate degree. Now, I, don't, I just graduated high school. But guess what? I got my jacket on every day. I got my suitcase. They said, Frederick, what you think about this guy? I'm, I'm 19, 18. They said, what you think about this candidate? Uh, I don't know about this candidate. I'm making those type of calls. I feel good, too. You know, I'm 18. I'm 19. But, but I didn't say that even brag on myself. I said that to say, guys, it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter where you went through. Don't let your life, don't let your past dictate or determine, you know, the same direction where you're going. I graduated from Gordon State College in 2010, went to the University of West Georgia, and graduated there in early childhood education. I couldn't read nor write, but I went, to, I went to school to teach those how to read and write. Went there, graduated in 2010. Not only did I graduate from there, I went back to Gordon State College. Oh, and I forgot even to mention that uh, a year and a half ago, I published my first book entitled Waiting on the Rain. I could not read, nor can I write, but guess what? I got a book out, so you tell me if I can read or write. Okay, so I published a book. And let me tell you how my book came about. My book came about because friends left me. So people are going to leave you. Some friends are going to leave you. So you need to dictate who your friends really are. So while my friends would invite my other friends to these parties because they were trying to turn up. So while they were turning up, I was over here, you know, turning up on this paper, right? So they turn it up, I'm turning up. And so every time they didn't invite me to a party, every time that, that I didn't get an invite, I was completing a chapter in my book. And until my book was finished. And so, and they motivated me. So you know what? When I see them today, I really do appreciate you for not inviting me to the party. I appreciate you for leaving me out of the group. I appreciate you for thanking me, for thinking that I'm not popular. But I promise you, all those friends I had, they are not speaking to students. They are not writing books. They're still trying to, what, turn up, right, in a different way. But I, I came back to Gordon as a resident director. Not only is that, guys, within a month later, I said I would love to teach a course for all African-American males. And they said, Frederick, we're going to let you teach that course. And I only have a bachelor degree. So I'm teaching a success course for all African-American males. Uh, uh, months later, they, they tripled my classes to three. So this semester, I'm teaching over 60 students. First year experience, first year experience guys, I'm teaching over 60 students. Not only that, the opportunity came for an AAMI grant. We wrote the grant, got the money, and Gordon said, okay, we're going to increase your pay just a little, and we want you to work with our guys. So I worked with an additional 40 more African-American males on the campus, teaching them how to be successful. Because success is defined how you want to define success. Not only that, guys, but I went to Gordon. But all these things, it because I, I asked, most of the things I asked if I could do it. I would love to teach. Let me do this. And then the president, he saw something in me. And he, said, well, Fred, he said, Frederick, I would love for you to mentor our uh, basketball team. Work with them once a week. Go out to dinner with them. And so, yeah, I had about four or five positions at one school. But guys, let me tell you something. This wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for people in my life. So when people come in your life, let them help you. 
Let them help you. After today, you should be looking me up on Facebook and say, well, what's, what's the next step I should do? Those who invited you here, those in this room, you should be saying, what must I do? I was watching a video. The guy said that you should want success as much as you want to breathe. That's how bad you want success. So guess what? Sometimes you got to turn the cell phone off. Sometimes you got to say, I cannot hang out today. Sometimes you got to say, I got to get focused because let me tell you something. No one is going to get it for you. And like I always tell everyone, we all have a bucket. My bucket needs to be filled with rainwater at that time. But really, I needed love in my bucket. I needed hope. I needed a friend. I needed a father figure. I needed a, a mother figure, a brother. And some of you guys in this room, you all have a bucket, ladies as well, and you want your bucket filled. So what, what needs to be filled in your bucket? Is it love? Is it a father figure, a role model? Is it more money? Okay, how are you going to get it? You got to have a goal. You got to have a plan. And it is about your education. And there's some other people in this room that you are the raindrops that need to be, that needs to be filling these buckets. So ladies and guys, allow others to fill your bucket, because I promise you it wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for people in my life. And so I stand before you right now, and every time I go back home, I am looked at as a success. I'm not big time famous. I'm not traveling the country just yet. I'm not, I haven't met Oprah just yet, all these big people. But I promise you, the small people that, in the small community that I've talked to, they're saying, wow, if this man can do it, I know I can do it. So whatever you're going through, whatever you've been through, you can be better than that. Be better than your father. Be better, better than your mother. Be better than the generation uh, uh, before, uh, before you. So I hope that I said something that have encouraged you. I hope that I said something that had motivated you. Please come and see me. I'll be out here somewhere at my table. My book's on sale. I have wristband. So if you guys have a chance to come and see me, please come and see me. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. We appreciate you for coming, and we appreciate, every, appreciate everyone for coming. And um, please go back to his table. You can check out his wristbands. He's got some books for sale. And um, make sure you um, come and see him afterwards. You can, he, he's going to be signing some books. And um, just talk to him, take some pictures with him. And we appreciate you all for coming today. Thank you.